Hello, everyone, and welcome to an evening with BMI's PhD fellows. My name is Alex Marzano Lesnovich. I'm a Shearing Fellow here at the Black Mountain Institute, and I'm lucky to be your host tonight to introduce you to the work of these incredible writers. Before we start, we would like to take a few minutes to acknowledge that the Black Mountain Institute operates from the city of Las Vegas, the traditional and unceded territory of the Niue or the Southern Paiute people. We encourage everyone in this space to engage in shared stewardship of the land, continued learning about the indigenous peoples who work and live and are still living on this land since time immemorial, including the Las Vegas Paiute tribe and the Moapa band of Paiutes and about the historical and present realities of colonialism. If you aren't already familiar with Black Mountain Institute, we aim to bring writers and the literary imagination into the heart of public life. We do this by way of year round events like this one, through fellowships, through student enrichment opportunities and through innovative media like Witness Magazine and Black Mountain Radio. So then a few reminders. Catch up with the second season of Black Mountain Radio at blackmountainradio.org. New episodes are every Sunday on your favorite podcast app. Join us May 5th through 7th for a three-day roving celebration with Wave In, a BMI festival that explores movement, connection, actions, and consequences. Sign up for the festival and learn more about BMI at blackmountaininstitute.org. Links are in the chat. So now, without further ado, let me welcome our first PhD fellow. Jimmy Bellow is a Washington DC native who is not your traditional writer. She is a writing, writer of consciousness. Through formal experimental narrative structure, her fiction wanders into the realm of mental illness, race, social institutions, and memory. She published two poetry chapbooks while studying history at Grinnell College. Jumi spent the majority of her 20s studying teaching high school in East Asia. She did a lot of things not involving creative writing, like uh, studying Mandarin Ch Chinese, becoming an advanced scuba diver, and riding motorcycles. And that last activity once got her turned into a meme on the Taiwan National News. At the Iowa Writers' Workshop, her debut novel manuscript was awarded the Michener Kronoplikas Prize in Fiction, and her work has been supported by Catapult, Corporeal Writing Center, Story Studio Chicago, Writing X Writers, and Tin House Summer Workshop. Take it away, Jimmy. Twenty nine, District of Columbia, cassette recording, six weeks. Zinma, Dr. Rivera suggested I try this in case I wind up sick by the time my baby arrives. I don't know if Dr. Rivera is right. I certainly hope she isn't but this is just in case. All I know is I can't wait for this child to arrive. I can't tell whether my hands are shaking because of you or because of this or because of me. Ever since I started taking lithium, my hands shake endlessly and you must know what this does to me not being able to write or at least why I haven't bothered writing since this illness of mine first began to take root. At least you know now I take lithium. I'm not well. I don't know if I will be well enough to be a mother, but dear God, then I want to. I want to with all my being. It surprises me with the force of it. This child is making a mother of me. A mother. My baby is six weeks, the size of a lentil. I feel about this child the way I feel about everyone I love. I pray that she will hold on, stay, be mine. Can't you see how much I mean this for you as well? There's a house somewhere where we were baking key lime pie together and laughing soon. How I've missed being with you, even though there are whole continents between us. I know you're thinking that what connects us must be shattered or at least battered to hell, but I'm here to tell you that there's another door left for us to open. Destruction has many allegiances to the woman. It promises an escape to a place that seems better from afar, but up close is unnerving. We both know that what being in a world without a mother, what leaving home means, but perhaps what makes things unnerving is the unknown tendrils of it curling around our necks, warm and heavy as night. Where the child begins is where I start to end and the beating block of it both frightens and excites me. To know I will continue, narcissistic as it is, satisfies some ancient anxiety inside me that our bloodline can't ever be reckoned with. 
never be given a chance to break the tide of trouble that's rained on our family. What will I become in its abyss? Perhaps I have to see the abyss as a welcoming one, as welcoming as the womb. I know at one point that I came into this world whole and somewhere along the way, fissures began to foster in the darkness. They pulsed, hidden and breathing in the wayward night. This is something I think you and I understand all too well, little sister. Somewhere along the way, they became voices. Voices that sounded very much like my own, ones that told me to think about things three times to make it feel finished within my head. I don't know why I think about things this way. There are a million possibilities underlay the specific architecture of my imagination, but I don't really bother to settle on any single one. Any of them could be true. It could be true that the death of our mother, the turbulence of being a motherless woman has rather unmade us than made. It could be true that the departure of any of the women in my life to be the true great unraveling. At least this is what I choose to believe. The presence of women in one woman's life works as a fundamental understanding of what being a woman is and what kind of woman I'd like to be, become. My idea of being a woman involves a child riding the spine of a wolf. Whether the child is any child isn't important. What's important is that the child is wild, free. It can feel the bones of the dog as it bows its body to the land and sprint along a river, unencumbered by what it is supposed to be, what it is to eat or where they are to go, but simply together. I think of my mother and I in such a way, both of us feared and wanted at once. I'm sorry if I'm beginning to sound vague, but then you're my sister and I was raised to expect to never be understood by you or any other woman, don't you think so? Don't you think you regard me in the same way even though you're supposed to love me? It's okay. I feel the same way too. So why am I saying this all to you now? I'm writing this to you now because outside the world is burning and inside mine is turning in my belly ready to split open. I want my childhood to be prepared but I'm not even sure whether I am. I'm frightened to be saying this over this cassette tape because I think it's the only way through and the only way through involves a morass of pain and filled with memories that have sleeping raptors. I'm willing to take up such steps if you're willing to listen little sister. I refuse to have a doctor tell you the story of how I came to be this way. I refuse to have someone else speak for me or put my letters into some shitty fall cabin and never to be opened again. You can't burn the sound of my voice or put it into a drawer, so these tapes will have to do. I want to use what is remaining to tell you what no one else will. I'm frightened of who I've become if you're listening to this. But there's one thing I'm frightened of more. That if this account doesn't exist, you won't know how much I love you wherever I am whether it's in this world or the next. I've been gone for a long, long time and I'm still gone. But maybe you regard this message as a telegram from a faraway place, from a traveler who intends to come home to you. Maybe you can regard these messages as a, as a vowed return, even if the returning never happens. You deserve to know that we both came from a place of love, however fleeting that place was. Just know that the place I've disappeared to is also the place where we began. Maybe this child's birth would be the death of me, or with luck, a version of me that I hope you never made. I have never felt compelled to keep an account of my life. To write my life would require me to examine it, to see what kind of person I would have become and who I became instead, whether I was good enough and whether all the things I've been told about myself were true. To be young, to be black, to be a woman is to face your destruction in innumerable ways or flee it or the knowledge of it or all these things at once. This is before illness opens the door. To struggle is a poetry of survival, not of defeat. I want more than anything for us to survive, both of us. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy, that was stunning. That was just absolutely stunning. All right, our next writer is Chateau Cho. He is a poet from Shanghai, China. He writes poems about past and ongoing extinctions. And one supposedly fun thing that he will never do again is adulting. His novel, The Man with a Camera Eye, is a semi-finalist for the 2021 Autumn House Fiction Contest. Take it away, please. Um, thank you, Alex. Um... It's great to be here. I'm gonna read four poems, uh, all written 
while I'm in Vegas. So here it goes, first poem, um, untitled. Out of Target's automatic doors, the sky is heartbreaking, blue-green, bold thing that a crushed Coke can tap dance between the parking lot arrows pointing different angles, knows this is the edge of the world. Waves of moon splashes down its teeny ting ridges, drunk red decks into each other. Every light of the night tilts. I can barely hold on to this question. Cold wind in a desert is from the sea. Two petals of calypso orchid kiss tremblingly at its lee. Second poem written because I was stuck here for about two years because of the pandemic and I couldn't go home. It's called um, 100 Pages of Proust Due on the Chinese New Year's Eve. Right now, I cannot bear to read my Proust a little patter of firecracker in my phone, heels on cobblestone at my heart. I have to walk all with you, Monsieur Proust. Tonight to your signs, I'm thinking fuzzy bunny eyes and my nephew's finger under the rabbit pen. There's small entirety, threads in between, winter sunbeam, unaware of my imagination, and nearly spilled pumpkin soup grandma brings from the farm. Snow sleeps under a string of footprints, crisp and murmuring certainty, and each and single of their good news, spring, festival lanterns, free red tassels, Dangles at the edges of last few oranges, a sun setting so full of ourselves and the old years still warm. He takes a sip and yells, hot, hot. Grandma smiles for a while. I have lost you, Monsieur Proust. In your petite phrase, in your smoke view room, I am thinking home, the other end of ocean. And what would happen if you and I don't have to make them little words stand for something and lower their first sound? Would the Milky Way be less accidental? I open up the window and let them all go at once, one and one, and I send them crackle and explode in a smoke. Compré, Balbec, Gilbert, Robert, Verturin, Germont, Berturin, Don, 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 Don. Third poem titled Naturaleza Muerta, which means still life, or uh, in Spanish, or literally dead nature. It's written in uh, Mexico City. But I dare not put her into the picture. She looked at me so calmly with a dark curiosity and a bright melancholy. Her chubby guacamaya eyes has discovered my secret, I think. I could, however, put her back easily together with 200 other kids, mestizos or nahuas in jolly green suits and a forbiddingly purple jacalanda trees, put them all under that dark dance statue around which they gather how they were told to look up with their nascent eyes to this last king of Spain, last king of New Spain, first king of Mexico. And I could zoom in on his charcoal fingers as raw and as seasoned as a skeleton clenching to a burnished scroll. Mashika, your tribal name shall be restored whose giant shadow like a sword swing over a plaza of bright, curious noses, and side by side objects are aligned, the dead fingers and the conquest that lives on, the live gazes and a perdon to a mother tongue. Some nature dead only on the outside, others survive only on the outside. 
Perhaps even a cold wind might blow by, smoothening any recalcitrant leaves, and all the shades will unify. But I dare not put her into the picture. I'm afraid that she might hear my tacit, unpermitted scribing of her and all my presumed measurements of her root appearance and hope, flaw, innocence, and toil will vaporize and a gleeful resignation to a unison of colors will be destroyed like cicada's wing under a meteoroid. I'm afraid of the invitationness of her eyes, that of no history, that of no language, that of no verdict, as the ice sheets on a cliff collapsing into the welcoming sea, when looking at me will invite me to join her human look, and her looking at me too, a man-shaped blank inside his own still life. And I close my eyes. Mila al fotografo. All right, my final poem um, is called Ten Ways of a Foxtail in Pudong New Economic Zone that is in Shanghai. And it's in 10 parts. I'm going to read them. Uh, there is going to be divided by numerals in Shanghainese. Yep. Amid 12 40 storied apartment buildings, the only thing that bows in the wind. Ni. At noon, I feel the sun burning up my nape and a small beetle refuging at my feet. Se. Un oh, the unsightly dirt they call you industrial waste and plant you under a sightly cement. You plant me. Under the white sun, a foxtail sweat green. Mm. A beetle on cement leaf tip is as tall as rooftop. Look. In sunset, every dust mote is clean. What does the garbage man come to glean? Chip. Evening drizzle on the broken tires chirp on pose a flock of birds. But this stalk that crouches ponderously the rain. Jew, scrap bikes falling each on each, a last one nudge my back. The, and a plain pale pain pounding pile driver. Chi, what was the question? a crack on the cement. Thank you. That was gorgeous, Sato. Thank you. Next up, we have Arish Qureshi. She was born in Dubai in the UAE. Her fiction explores familial relationships, cultural identity, memory, and their effects on the psyche. She holds an MFA from the University of Washington, Seattle, and an MA and BA in English from Rutgers University. Outside of writing, she enjoys food, cooking, teaching, graphic design, language, and drawing. Her stories appear or have received accolades from Entropy, Parentheses Journal, Glimmer Train Press, Craft Literary, Salamander Magazine, and New Millennium Writings. And her favorite childhood book is Anne of Green Gables because, and I quote, Anne is the way, the truth, and the life. She is a second year PhD candidate at UNLV and the fiction editor for Witness Magazine. Please take it away. Thank you, uh, Alex, for that introduction. Um, and thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Um, shout out to my parents who are always in the audience for all of my readings, which makes me happy because at least I'll always have two people in my uh, corner as opposed to zero <laughs> when I do readings. So. Um, oh, and thank you, Xiao Xiao and Jumi, for those readings. The, those pieces were wonderful. So um, I hope everyone can hear me and see me okay. I'm going to be reading a short story, which is one of the um, most recent flashes that I've written called What His Eyes See at Night. Um, alternate title is The Night She Returns to See. And um, it has a very folktale kind of slant to it. <clears throat> I want to tell you another story, Sony. Once upon a time, a group of men set off for a day of hunting in the forest in a jeep. 
They took with them a little boy who belonged to the youngest one of them. He'd been wanting to accompany his father for months, and the father, eager to take his son hunting for the first time, decided that he was ready now. His own father had taken him at a similar age, but perhaps he'd been a little older. The men set up their camp in the forest and prepared to begin the day. The boy, excited to explore, managed to slip away from between them when he was supposed to be doing a small task his father had given him. He didn't go too far, but he was a little one, and the foliage concealed him from the others. In his excitement, he did not mind this. The trees and bushes were so tall and green and alluring. Presently, he needed to relieve himself. Had his father and friends known this, they would have been able to help him do it properly and safely, but the boy was too far away for that. So he relieved himself among some bushes and went off chasing dragonflies and digging in the mati. Before long, the boy's father noticed that the task he'd given him lay abandoned and that his son was missing. Alarmed, he informed his companions and they all broke up to search for him at once, fearful that he'd been met with a mishap. The forest was full of creatures that, while not dangerous to them, could assuredly pose harm to a child. But to their immense relief, they found him not too far off, sound asleep beneath a tree. They checked him for injuries, thankful upon finding none. So they carried him into the tent to let him nap and proceeded to hunt, his father a little saddened that his son could not enjoy it with them after all. All went well for most of the day, but the group returned home earlier than planned with the boy ill from a terribly high bukhat. His parents put him to bed and tended to him, but to no avail. By nightfall, he was delirious, babbling and thrashing about, seemingly distressed, in and out of consciousness. The father was in tatters, holding himself responsible. The mother was anguished to see his suffering. And when it came to the dead of the night, the boy began rasping in a voice that was not his and speaking in tongues he had never learned. Three sleepless days and nights passed. Finally, after no amount of treatment or medicine helped their child in the slightest, the parents, harrowed and distraught, turned to the elder of the family, who was also the wisest among them the boy's great-grandfather. He examined the boy and realized that this was not a natural illness. Thus, he also realized that it could not be cured through natural means. He spent hours in prayer, keeping vigil by the boy's bedside, seeking answers they did not have. Then, when it seemed like all hope was lost, the boy turned his head to his grandfather, opened his eyes, and floated several feet off the bed. Everyone gathered, shrieked, and wailed in terror, silenced at last by the boy's mother, who shouted at them to let her grandfather-in-law finish what he set out to do. The boy's mouth opened, and an unknown voice informed the room that he was being justly punished. That was when the elder realized that the child was possessed. Possessed by a jinn, Sony. You know of them, don't you? Possessing us in San is one of the many powers they have over us. Before the veil that separated our worlds descended, they did this quite often, though some of them do it to this day. They use it to display their might, to amuse themselves, to frighten us. And sometimes they use it to punish us. The elder asked why they were tormenting an innocent child so. The jinn, speaking through the levitating boy, told him that three days earlier, the boy had urinated on a sleeping jinn child. Jin live in the forest, Sony, you remember that? It just so happened that this particular forest was one of their dwellings. And this Jin child, like the rest of its kind, had been sleeping through the day as Jin do. Jin awake and roam about at night, as everyone but the boy had known. The Jin child's father, the very being who possessed the little boy now, had been enraged by the human's arrogance and how they had used this child as a receptacle for their waste. He determined that the boy and his family needed to atone. He claimed that he had already entered the boy's body by the time he was found sleeping. The elder pleaded with the jinn to hear him out. He explained to him that the boy's actions had been done in innocence, that he was a very young child, that he had slipped away from the humans that were tasked with supervising him. Humans who would have ensured that he relieved himself without disturbance. They would have announced it to the trees, just as people do to this very day when passing waste in woods and jungles. Jinn are unseen to human eyes unless they choose not to be, after all. How could the child have known? 
The elder apologized for the negligence of the boy's caretakers and begged him to lift his curse, promising that they would never repeat their error. The jinn was not hard of heart. Seeing the human's desperation thawed him a little. Therefore, he granted them his forgiveness and departed the boy's body. However, he left with a warning to never hunt in that forest again. He vowed that the consequences, should he catch them there a second time, would be dire. The parent of the child readily agreed. And within the next day, the boy awoke, speaking in his own voice and unaware of anything that had transpired after he had run off on his own in the forest. It took several days for him to fully recuperate, but sure enough, he then became the same merry, curious boy he had always been. The humans held true to their word and never stepped foot into the forest again. All was well. But Sony, even after many years went by and the boy was fully grown, even after he set out on his own, after his parents found him a wife, and after he had built his own home and began to live a contented life filled with light and good fortune and few hardships. Sometimes, on the rarest of nights, his wife would be roused by her sleeping husband speaking in a tongue neither of them had learned. Sometimes, in the midst of the day, he would be overcome by fatigue and take a nap that lasted hours, engulfed in the scent of shrubbery and dew, plagued by a recurring hwab, the visceral sense of an invasive presence dwelling within his body for days and being ushered out amid the echoes of despairing prayers by a stronger, older, less relenting one. Sometimes, in the dead of the night, as his wife slept by his side, the boy would lie awake. And sometimes, on those nights, the man would see a shadowy figure that stood in the corner of the room. A figure that resembled a woman, but that he knew could not be, because she had the feet of a lion and the horns of a beast. And sometimes, this creature who appeared as a woman would peer at him from where she stood, curiously. Sometimes, the boy was certain that she smiled, seeming pleased that now, he too knew what it was like to have his sleep disrupted. Thank you, everyone. That was so evocative, Arish. Thank you. Next up, we have Miranda Hanish, a writer and teacher who grew up in Las Vegas. Her favorite thing in Vegas is actually on Mount Charleston, though, and it's a tree. The Jeffrey Pine, which she says smells just like butterscotch, really. Her work focuses on early modern drama and its intertext, and she's especially fascinated by magic, gender bending, unruly women, and modern reinterpretations of Shakespeare. She has a BA in English from Amherst College, where she was awarded fellowships by the Folger Shakespeare Library and Doshana University. Outside of writing, she loves travel and languages. She has lived and worked in Tokyo, Kyoto, Paris, and several cities in Spain. Please take it away. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Uh, so this will be a little different, uh, and I ask your indulgence. I'm BMI's Literary Studies Fellow, which means I spend a lot of time digging around uh, reading plays and poems from the 1600s and elsewhere. Uh, and thinking about which of those works deserve more of our consideration today. Uh, and so today I'm going to share with you a little of my research in progress. Uh, and my, in particular, my pitch for what's extraordinary and surprising and just plain entertaining uh, about a little known early work uh, by John Milton known nowadays as Comus a mask. Um, so I've got some pictures for you. Uh, so a quick background. Thank you so much for I appreciate it. Uh, so um, so a quick background. Uh, the mask was a type of courtly entertainment uh, performed by aristocrats and for aristocrats, kind of a cross between a play and an opera and a masked ball. Uh, and here you can see some of the costume designs used in other masks. Uh, sadly, not this particular one. Um, now, this particular mask was performed to celebrate the virtue of chastity. It's not very exciting. Uh, so it's not especially popular today, but I argue that 
if you read it closely, Comus is actually a very deliberately gender bent rewrite of book 10 of the Odyssey with the seductive temptress Circe as a man, the stern rational Odysseus as a young woman. Now it's a critical commonplace that in his epic poem, Paradise Lost, Milton reinvented the Greek and Latin epics of Homer and Virgil and put them in a new context to create a specifically Christian epic. Critics haven't really looked for those parallels uh, in Comus because it's about a young girl who gets lost in the woods uh, and approached by an untrustworthy enchanter. It's, she's not your average epic hero, but Milton very deliberately calls our attention to Homeric parallels. Uh, and so I wanted to quickly summarize uh, book 10 of the Odyssey and what it can teach us about how to read Comus. Uh, so this 1580 painting that you can see uh, shows in part the events of book 10. Uh, Odysseus and his mariners are trying to get home and they get lost in a wood and separated. Odysseus and mariners hear the song of the enchanter Circe. They're misled by her, follow her when she invites them to dine. She offers them fine chairs to sit in. She tempts them with food and drink. In eating, they are transformed into animals. Now, meanwhile, elsewhere in the wood, um, you, can, uh, you can see here, so now on the right, uh, on the left, uh, there's a helpful spirit, the god Hermes. He approaches Odysseus and warns him about his men's danger. Hermes has brought a remedy against Circe's sorcery, it's a flower called moly. He tells Odysseus that if he eats it, Circe's potions will not be able to enchant him. Protected by this flower, Odysseus goes forth to fight Circe and free his men. Now, that's the Odyssey in Comus. The lady, played by a 15-year-old girl, is trying to go home just like Odysseus and his mariners. She gets lost in the wood, separated from her brothers. She follows the sound of revelry and meets the enchanter, Comus. And Milton tells us that Comus is, quote, of Circe born, and deep skilled in all his mother's witcheries. He has a rod and a cup like Circe, and you can see the images of Circe on the left and Comus on the right. Um, Comus traps the lady in an enchanted chair, tries to tempt her into drinking his sinister potion. And meanwhile, the lady's brothers, elsewhere in the wood, meet a spirit who warns them that their sister is in danger. The spirit tells them about a magic herb that can defeat Comus, Hymene, which appears to be a small unsightly root even though in another country, it's revealed to be a golden flower. Now this flower we're told is quote, unknown, unlike esteemed, and yet more medicinal is it than that molly that Hermes wants to wise Ulysses gave. A very direct parallel there. Uh, and so here, I think it's fascinating is, is Milton's trick, the crux of the mask, I argue the purpose of the illusions. Milton's scholarly listeners are primed by the Homeric cues to expect a very certain kind of story. Uh, the lady is threatened by Comus. She seems to stand in for the lost and subservient mariners in need of rescue. The brothers seem to represent Odysseus receiving the herb, about to save the lady who, under patriarchal norms, they're responsible for. Uh, and so we expect the brothers to break into Comus's feast, cast down the enchanter, and save their sister transformed into an animal. But instead, when the scene shifts, we discover the lady is neither an animal nor a helpless victim. She's still human. She hasn't drunk from the cup. And she's revealed as a savvy debater. Uh, she vigorously rebuffs Comus's temptations, saying, quote, fool, do not boast. 
Thou canst not touch the freedom of my mind with all thy charms. So Milton thus forces us to question our easy assumptions and reinterpret what may have earlier seemed like a straightforward adaptation of the myth. Uh, in emphasizing the freedom of her mind, the lady reveals herself as Odysseus's true Odysseus, uh, as Milton's true Odysseus figure. Uh, in the Renaissance, Odysseus was above all renowned for his stoic endurance and his strength of mind. The poet George Chapman praises Odysseus as a hero who demonstrates, quote, the mind's inward, constant, and unconquered empire, unbroken, unaltered. The lady's stoic virtue and her eloquence Recall Odysseus's ability to resist the sensual lures of Circe and the sirens, as well as his skill with words. And so just as the unassuming Haimonia turns out to be more impressive than the divine Moli, so true the unassuming lady is revealed to be far more than a mere lost child in need of saving by her brothers. Comus cannot tempt her. He can only trap her in an enchanted chair. Now, in a similar upending of patriarchal hierarchies, even Comus's power is ultimately revealed as secondary to that of the good spirit Sabrina, a female spirit representing a local Welsh river who ultimately reverses all of Comus's spells. So in reversing these hierarchies, I argue Milton emphasizes his Christian moral where inner strength of will and mind granted by God allow seeming victims to be revealed as more powerful than their supposed overlords or protectors. Uh, so how did the noblemen uh, in this mask uh, feel about having their power usurped um, by their sister and their role as Odysseus usurped by the sister? And we'll never know for sure, but one of the noblemen playing the brothers later wrote in his copy of Milton's Defensio Pro Populo Anglicano, so the defense of the English people, uh, that quote, the book should be burnt, the author hanged. Uh, so though Comus is hardly a revolutionary tract, its subversive twist on patriarchal authority reveals Milton's Republican imagination already at work. Uh, and I argue that this mask deserves a more central place in our consideration of Milton's development as a poet and a thinker and a religious philosopher. But more importantly, it's time to read it as part of a long and living and vibrant tradition of gender bending the Greek myths. Thank you. That was fascinating, Miranda, thank you. Uh, next up, we have Shreys Jasen who is a poet from Delhi and one of the founding editors of the Shoreline Review, an online journal by and for South Asian poets. They studied literatures in English from Delhi University and completed their MFA at Sarah Lawrence College, New York. Their work can be found published or forthcoming in Apogee, Bitch Media, Boat, Hyperallergic, Hyphen Magazine, The Margins, Rumpus, and elsewhere. They're a Gemini Cancer cusp who doesn't know too much about astrology, but pretends to for, quote, the great queer assimilation state, state. She was the 2017 2018 Readings Workshops Fellow at Poets and Writers and is currently looking for a job for the next academic year if anyone in the audience is hiring. Take it away. Thank you, Alex, for that intro and for emceeing the entire night. Um, if if I, if you can't hear me, just let me know in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate the rest of the readers so much for their work. Thank you for reading today. My gratitude always to BMI for organizing this, especially Leila, who is a hundred times better at emails than any of us will ever be. And um, of course, thank you to you all for tuning in, especially if you still hear um, for me and Dorothy, appreciate you, grateful for you. Um, I have four points for you. Long before I was mad myself is how I start a lot of my stories these days. It is fun 
to watch my own discomfort visit another's face for once and i like to make my audience nervous especially when my audience is me long before i was man myself i longed to be something else not quite man not quite not um but it made my father nervous and i don't like to do that i never have my father is a nervous man especially at airports he says it because my mother gets nervous and then he worries about her heart so he gets a little shaky too long before i was a man myself i was a daughter trying to bring my parents to me since i moved to this country they can't fly alone though my father over the phone says why don't you come here take your mother and fly back together The first time an immigration officer yelled what is the purpose of your visit into my father's ear three times my mother got nervous yelled back he is hard of hearing can i come over from across the yellow line this was after i dropped them off in another country after i had walked into a women's bathroom with my mother and a stranger in an attempt to be helpful i'm sure well not sure but i guess She rushed over and said, "Sir, I was a not man by then. This is the wrong bathroom." And my mother could not look at me for four days until the airport, where we hugged in silence. I should mention I didn't leave. I also didn't say, "No, it's the right bathroom, or at least the one I want." Instead, I said, "Nay, nay, my lucky ho. No, I am girl." Long before I became man myself I was nervous and after I was still nervous all the fucking time This is um this is our poetica as buffet all you can eat but make it poor yum the slurps the swallows this survey of my offering father issues the obsession with the word mutton that one sex dream i had at age 11 featuring keanu reeves and shahrukh khan you name it everything for the price of one meal every loss i learned to butcher dead into blood and meat fit to your bloating my mother is too busy cooking herself down in the kitchen hidden but she made everything i ladle once i thought i got it fish whole but when i dished it out all i had were diced mangoes and a feedback form said what's so different about this one i prefer the other indian restaurant more vegetarian options and not as spicy come see the soda machine every gulp an origin myth at the end of the day any day reader eater won't you look i have so much left to give and this is landscape with the fall of acres as if history only paraphrased the year everyone was dying i was desperate for a job looking to know how i would live in the future even as the future itself began to turn impossible by which i mean i just wanted to see my mother or i didn't have it in me to chart a route or a turn i mostly mean i was crying on the street every time i thought of a friend or a lover or that essay by joseph osmondson about grieving our heated planet and then some I confess I danced my heart a village again this season a yoke how we stoked our hopes back into surviving breathing things here the sky some of us braced for the collapse some of us ready to fly again oh our sweat swayed the music thrummed speeches flooded our screen everything so eager to be loud we almost missed the already drowned 
Thank you so much. And I'm going to end my reading with um, three couplets from this poem by George Abraham that I've been thinking a lot about given the world we live in. And also because I see in him the work I hope my own poems will someday do. And I'll link the complete poem after I'm done reading. Thank you to you all again for listening. I'm very grateful. Ars Poetica, in which every pronoun is a free Palestine. And so it is written, the settlers will steal God's land and free Palestine will curse the settlers with an inability to season free Palestine's food. A sunburn the shape of the settler dictator's face on everyone who will claim free Palestine's earth, but not free Palestine's skin. Soil stained, there. Free Palestine said it. No one really owns anything. Free Palestine didn't unright to make it so. Free Palestine sea, Israeli. Free Palestine sky, Israeli. But not Free Palestine's thunder. The blame will always be Free Palestine's. And so this will be called an accurate history. It is written. The blood will be on free Palestine hands. Thank you so much. That was amazing, Shrestha. Thank you. Lastly, finally, we have Dorothy Alred Solomon, who was born into a, into a polygamous household, the middle kid, 28th of 48 children born to her father, but married a Vietnam veteran who said, quote, one wife is more than enough. She took her master's and bachelor's degrees from the University of Utah. Her writing has received several awards and her books include In My Father's House, Predators, Prey, and Other Kinfolk, Daughter of the Saints, The Sisterhood, and Finding Karen, An Ancestral Mystery. She is currently at work on Home Fires, which is about the impact of combat-related PTSD on families. Please, Dorothy, see us out tonight. So, um, Shrestha, that was beautiful and um, a good segue into what I'm going to read tonight. I'm sorry to bring up the specter of war in a world that is rife with it, um, but I think it's important to remember that war doesn't end after the bombing and shooting is over. Um, it's really humbling to be among such brilliant and talented people. And uh, I thank you for persevering with me. So this is a chapter, a part of a chapter called Homecoming from Home Fires. For two hours, I have rocked the baby against my hip, standing at the airline gate and waiting for Bruce to appear. Denise is 14 months old. Her father's only acquaintance with his daughter has been through word pictures and photographs that were weeks old by the time he received them in Vietnam. The baby has started saying, da, da, while pointing at the filigree frame in my bedroom that holds a portrait of a young Marine, the blue of his eyes heightened by the dress blues uniform, his firm mouth above an uncompromising jaw. I often wish I could show Denise a photograph of her father as he was when I started dating him, the soft beta bangs and mischievous smile. The mailman wears a peaked cap similar to Bruce's marine dress cover. And every weekday as I carry the baby to the mailbox, I say, let's see if we have a letter from daddy. Recently, the baby has started to hold out her tiny hand to the mailman calling dad, dad. I knew I should end the mail ritual, but this one routine felt like hope. Now I'm wondering what will happen if Bruce hears his daughter call the mailman daddy. The huge aircraft rolls past the windows and bumps into place. I shudder and take a deep breath. 
The baby studies me with cerulean eyes like her father's, and she pats my cheeks with plump little hands. I wonder, does she sense my fear and hold her closer? Airline personnel hurry up the gangway to lift the hatch. After a pause, passengers trudge past, wilted from the journey in the late hour. Denise is tired too, rubbing her eyes and whimpering. She should have been in bed three hours ago. But we have waited so long for this day. People move around us, watching their feet or gazing down the long hallway. A few passengers glance up and spare the baby a smile. The reception area is nearly deserted. No one waving banners, declaring welcome home. I know I could have filled the gate area with friends and family, but I didn't invite anyone. Not with the controversy about the war, not with the miasma surrounding Bruce. Besides, this reunion of our fledgling family is private, almost sacred. And I don't want to jinx a homecoming that has verged on impossible. The line of people from the plane dwindles to none. I crane my neck to see if Bruce is coming down the jetway, but I see only the stewardess stepping aside for the pilot who strides toward me with his back overnight, black overnight bag tucked beneath his arm. He tips his hat and smiles. Da, the baby murmurs around her thumb. Involuntarily, I put out a hand to stop him. Are more people on board? Just the stewardess. He disappears down the walkway before I think to ask about passenger manifests. The reception area is silent and empty. I check my watch for the hundredth time. A trembling begins in my solar plexus and spreads through my stomach and shoulders. I have been living with some version of this anxiety for 17 months, feeling that until Bruce's feet touch American soil, he can be sucked into the war and killed before we've had a chance to begin our lives as a family. I breathe into the cold block of fear in my chest and try to reason away the tremors, but reason doesn't hold. In the past year, I've become personally familiar with Murphy's Law, discovering that if something can go wrong, given the star-crossed era of Vietnam, it will. I yank a clean cloth diaper from my bag and use it to blot my face. Maybe I've been fooling myself. Maybe they gave Bruce the opportunity to leave, but he didn't want to come home. Maybe all these months when I thought he was been, being jerked around by military brass, he delayed his return on purpose. No more eager to return to me than he was to his mother's house. Maybe he had volunteered for another tour of duty, accepting the $6,000 reenlistment bonus in place of a safe, low octane life with me and his daughter. He's like that, isn't he? He wants the thrill and does what he wants regardless. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to skip over the barriers to Bruce's homecoming. He'd been held in Vietnam a full four months past his rotation date. And I'll skip over what it took to get past them. But I'd like you to see the 20 year old Marine Corps combat veteran who feels like an old man, a scant three days after he was loach lifted out of a firefight near Vietnam's DMZ, then put on a military plane at Da Nang, and seated on a commercial jet in Okinawa, where he doesn't have the clothing to shed his stained utilities, only to be spit on and called baby killer by a fierce woman when he changes planes at the San Francisco airport. Bruce keeps his seat as the plane touches down in Salt Lake City. He watches the passengers file past. The pilot throws him a salute before he leaves. The stewardess stands at the hatch, holding his trophy AK-47. Time to go, Marine. After you, he says. I can't leave you on board. It's against the rules. He shakes his head. Give me a minute. She sighs and props his rifle against the door frame. She busies herself with adjustments to the coffee maker, then tests the doors and drawers. She lifts her little suitcase. The maintenance people will be all over this plane in five minutes. I'm leaving you in their hands. 
don't get me fired. She gives him a sad smile and vanishes into the passageway. He stands and comes forward to the hatch, bends to watch the stewardess descend. She stops to talk to a slim blonde woman holding a baby, and he realizes that she is talking to his wife. And deja vu sweeps over him. He joined up and went to war because of her, and now he's coming back to her. After all the tears and blood, he's coming home. It makes no sense for him to be alive. No sense at all. And I'll skip another interlude about why he chose to enlist in the Marine Corps. Ever since the stewardess told me he's on board, I haven't seen my eyes. I haven't taken my eyes off the jetway. It's another five minutes before Bruce emerges. He has a rifle in one hand, a knapsack over his shoulder. He's terribly thin, but muscles ripple as he comes toward me. He stops before me, his blue eyes red limbed and unfathomably old. Hello, you. I hold up the baby. This is your daughter, Denise. Denise, this is your daddy. He bends and puts finger under Denise's chin. He says, hey, there's lots of little kids in Vietnam who look just like you. I jerk away like I've been slapped. He's home, thank God, but this? Even though he's grinning, I'm realizing nothing will be the way I dreamed it during those long nights praying for him to come home. This moment is the first in a pattern. Me as the straight man in his comedy routine that we will play out for the rest of our lives together. He bends and kisses me briefly like I'm his sister. Let's go home. Do you have baggage? Oh, I've got baggage, all right. Just nothing I have to pick up. Everything I have in the world is right here. He puts an arm around me and the baby. Together, we stumble along the walkway, out the terminal doors, into a starless night. Nine months later, he strolls beneath Catawba trees in an old Salt Lake City subdivision, carrying his little daughter on his shoulders. He can feel her wriggle against his neck as she reaches into the leaves, giggling as seedlings tickle her face. He feels her joy, a fountain strong and clear as the spring sunshine. His wife laughing too, and then a shriek and drops of blood hit his hand where he holds tight to the tiny arm. One, two, three bright stains on the white anklet above the white shoe. And her mother pulls the little girl down saying, what's happened? What's the matter, baby? And as the weight leaves his shoulders, his fingers curl, his hands begin to purple as he stares out at the other place, the village ensconced by jungle, seeing the pile of little arms and the black clad women holding their screaming, one-armed children, everyone screaming and pointing at him, blood and snot everywhere, and the Viet Cong running like rats for the tree line, the very ones who cut the arms off the U.S. troops who vaccinated them, also bastards, in ignoring what the Viet Cong could do. So let's pray for peace and celebrate Poems for peace, like Sharif says. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dorothy. And thank you all for joining us tonight to celebrate BMI's PhD fellows. And thank you again to all our fabulous PhDs. You can learn more about BMI at blackmountainstitute.org. Thank you again and have a good night. <laughs>